students having one specific place to go instead of various different sites to jump between. So that reduces the cognitive load very much by just having everything on the one page. And we also are bringing together evidence-based pedagogies using, um, using specific tools to guide teaching um, in specific ways. And I'll talk uh, more specifically about some of the pedagogies that we rely and build our resources around very shortly. Oh, look at that. That's how shortly. So within our lessons, you'll see things like learning intentions and success criteria. We're very much um, aligned with visible learning techniques. All throughout, you'll also see real world connections. So we know that students seeing the relevance of science is crucial to their engagement within science. You'll also notice that the lessons are scaffolded from lower order thinking to higher order thinking. So there's an entry point for all students within our lessons, and they are designed to gradually build students' confidence and competence so that they can master scientific skills. You'll also notice some visible thinking routines throughout, and we'll be looking at a, a visible thinking routine within one of the lessons very shortly. And a number of our tools facilitate collaboration between students really beautifully as well. So here's a little bit of an example of one of our science news lessons, which is uh, very much anchored in a specific scientific phenomena. So that means that, as I mentioned, not only are the lessons relevant, but they're also very practical. And the structure of each of our units is very much aligned with the 5E model. So students are engaged to begin with. Um, we have include career profiles throughout each one of our units where there is a real life person who talks about how they apply that specific type of science within their everyday work. Before we then go on to explore through practical activities investigations and engineering challenges. Then we dive a little bit deeper into explain and elaborate. And as I mentioned, lessons are scaffolded from lower to higher order thinking. And finally, including the evaluate aspect with tests and quizzes throughout and the use of key questions and visible thinking routines. So just to bring you into the loop of our alignment with the NGSS, we have begun a very large project of adapting our content from the Australian curriculum that it was originally built around to align it fully to the NGSS. And thankfully for us, the two curricula are very similar and we're already very close. But by the end of this year, we are planning to be 100% NGSS aligned. So that's actually a little bit of an update since these slides were written, but um, we have very much um, started that work already and are almost there with um, bringing everything into line so that it's ready for you to use. All right, I am going to very sh shortly dive into style and ask each of you to join me as a student. So it's, it's always nice to put your student hat on. I'll be asking you to do that for me this morning. There we are, I'm just bringing my screen up. All righty. Fantastic. So what you can see on my screen now is my style homepage. And I am within the Salinas Union High School District School. And I'll tell you um, a little bit later on about how the organization of schools and, and district districts work. But right now I've got a completely blank homepage. So to begin with, I need to create a subject. And we think of a subject as a collection of resources and of students. So this morning, my subject is going to be titled Professional Development. And I'll also 
pop the date in there just to help me. So easy as that, I can create my subject. And once it turns green for me, which generally doesn't take this long, but it's, it's early over here, so the internet's probably still warming up. Um, there we are. I can click into it and I have this lovely little owl telling me that I'm here in my shiny new subject. So I can add lessons to the subject here and I can also add students. So before I get each of you in as students, I am going to want to put some content in here. So I will start by browsing the lesson library. And I have a few different options, which we'll explore later. There are some school libraries and you'll see that those are identified by the little schoolhouse icon. But I'm going to start with our style library to begin with. And here is our library page with lots and lots of beautiful resources that are ready for you to use. I can use the filters to look for anything specific that I'm after. So I might be wanting to look at the physical sciences and I can also add a grade level in there if I so choose. So I can um, use those filters to guide me towards what I'm looking for. But right at the top of the library, and it's always worth having a look, you'll find anything that's particularly new and exciting. So it's coming up to what's known as Science Week in Australia. And we always develop some special uh, resources around Science Week. So this year, we have developed for the third year in a row a, an escape room. And we just love uh, making these and students absolutely love doing them. We also have developed a science news lesson that aligns with, this, with the science theme of Science Week. And this year, the theme is genetically modified food. Now, in the interest of ensuring that science is relevant to all of our students, you'll notice that there is a series of lessons here that are tied to real world current science news. So for instance, there are lessons going all the way back to the Amazon fires, uh, but, but this particular Science Week lesson is about genetically modified food. Of course, one of the big issues that we covered as well was coronavirus and the emergence of coronavirus. You'll see the new coronavirus uh, followed by slowing the spread and the change in coronavirus. So those are very much worth checking out as well. We do have a series of skill builders and these are included within each of, uh, within our units and we do teach skills as they are required within the units. But if you are wanting to focus specifically on scientific skills, this unit is a wonderful place to start. So you'll see lessons that work specifically on things like reading graphs, making observations and inferences, identifying errors and so on. So something else that's really worth taking a closer look at. Now, this morning, I am going to be looking at our energy unit. It's one of our newest ones, which is why I'm excited to show it to you this morning. And when I click on one of the thumbnails within the library, I'm given a really beautiful summary here. It tells me roughly what age um, or grade of students this unit is appropriate for. It gives me a brief overview followed by the big ideas and some of the highlights within that unit. Also really handy is a short highlights video, as well as a six week teaching plan. Uh, and whether that um, aligns with your sequence or not, it can be really useful just to take a look at the suggested sequence. So you can see here, um, how this is broken down into the structure of the lesson, anything that you might use to supplement um, with homework and how you might uh, ask students to consolidate or prepare for the following day.
So now that I've found my energy unit, I'm wanting to just check that the lessons are what I'm expecting them to be before I um, assign this one to my students. So what I'm particularly looking for is forms of energy, specific things about kinetic energy, and I can see here that that looks like it's all covered. So there's a lesson here on kinetic energy, there's an investigation, there are some practical activities. So this has everything that I'm looking for. And I'm also really pleased to see there's a glossary and a test as well as quizzes throughout. So all my assessment bases are covered too. If I want to preview any of these lessons, so I might want to take a closer look at what this practical activity looks like. I simply click on it and I can scroll through and check that this is everything that I'm wanting. So having a quick scroll through, I'm looking pretty happy with this unit. And I'm going to head back to the library and add this one to my subject. So I, all I need to do here is click add unit, continue. And what's happening now is this unit is being copied into my subject. So it's making me my own specific copy that I can then modify and change and do anything that I like to, and it isn't going to affect what anyone else is seeing within their library or within their subject. So it's making me my own version, and I can use all of Style's customization tools to tailor it to my students, my teaching style, um, or my school and my unit plan or scope and sequence. So what I'm able to do next is I will be adding some students and that's where you all come in. So while this is copying, I'm just going to duplicate my um, window here. And I am going to head back to my subject and move into the students tab. And it's from this students tab where my students will gain access for the first time. And I have two options here. I am able to invite students by email. So if I have a list of email addresses from my students or I can export a list, I simply just copy and paste those into here. And that will send my students an email with a link to get them straight in. And this is a one-time process. So once students have joined the subject, they are able to come straight back to style uh, and log in. And we have got single sign-on set up for you. So their regular school logins will work to get them straight into style nice and easy. Another way that we can give students access for the first time is by using the class code. So what I'll ask each of you to do for me now is head to this address in another tab in your browser and I'll drop that into the chat for you. And it will ask you to enter a class code and I will copy that one into the chat for you as well. While Alex is putting these in the chat, Peter, I wonder if you can tell us, is kindergarten and um, first grade, is there a, like a shift by one year for Australia? and New Zealand schools, see Josh Leach in the chat. You're, you're muted, sorry, Peter. Uh, so uh, kindergarten, uh, so we have in, in Australia and New Zealand, we have kindergarten and then we go all the way through first grade through to 12th, so similar to the US here. So. We don't. We have pre-K, but not as much as the US has pre-K uh, as part. Pre-K in Australia is very much um, outside of the sort of the K-12 school environment. So when it's asking for your school email address, this is just just your um, Salinas UHSD email address. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're, you're spot on, Peter. New Zealand's actually a little bit more complicated, but we won't go into it. <laughs> yeah. Um, everything that you see, however, within style is customized for the USA. So you'll see that it mentions things like grades. We um, have made sure that it's in, in the USA terminology. 
So if you see mentioned to grade five, it is talking about the same grade five that, that you are mentioning. Now I'm just wanting to check that every, everyone is happy and on board before I keep moving. Is anyone having any issues with that there? Looking good? Okay, now it is there in the chat. So if at any point you are wanting to um, jump in and you haven't been able to, the instructions are there for you and do give a shout if you're having any problems. Okay, so here's my shiny new class. I'm very excited to be teaching my wonderful students this morning. And I can see I've actually got a number of options here that I want to point out to you. I'm able to add any co-teachers. So I might be sharing this uh, group of students with Robin. I might want to add Robin as a co-teacher so that she can come in and work with these students just in the same way that I can. So I can manage my co-teachers here and just invite them with their email address. So that is also really useful for, um, I'm trying to think of the terminology, we would call them a relieving teacher, substitute teachers. Um, that's really handy for um, things like substitute teachers or, or just general um, class sharing and collaboration as well. Now, all of my students have populated on the screen for me, and I can see some of you have been into style before. I have some options here that are really handy, but that I've just realized that you actually aren't going to need. So because your students are set up with single sign-on, their password is, is going to be just the same as they use for everything else. You aren't going to need to do anything like reset their passwords. If you need to remove a student from your class, sometimes we don't have the luxury of doing that, but if you are needing to remove a student from your class, it's as simple as just clicking on the little trash can there. Sadly, not always that simple in real life though, is it? Okay. Peter and Alex, can I interrupt for a moment? Um, just so teachers understand, we're not going to be rostering style through Clever. We're going to be rostering style through uh, Google through Google Classroom and so this um, invite students by email class code how do you explain that piece Peter or Alex so it actually therefore is going to be much easier for you than this you won't need to do this process so this is this is how um how we will get each of you in to our subject today but for you your students are going to be pre-populated for you easy as that. Okay, so now I have my students, I have my lessons, and I feel like I'm ready to go. Uh, I, I've obviously prepared beforehand, um, I, and we're going to come back to that preparation phase. But right now I can see I've got all of my students and they're in my subject and they have access to all of these lessons. Now, that might be a little overwhelming to begin with. So what I'm actually going to do is hide everything. And I only want to make available to my students what, what I want them to be working on, just so that it's, it's nice and easy for me to guide them to the right place, but also so that they aren't overwhelmed and so that they don't race ahead. Sometimes we have students that are super eager and they'll be working three weeks ahead of themselves. And, um, you know, it, I need to be able to make sure that there aren't any misconceptions lurking or misunderstandings happening while they're doing that. So today I'm going to be working with this forms of energy lesson. And right now you can see that it's hidden from my students. I am not going to release it just yet, and I'll explain, a I'll explain that to you very shortly. But when I am ready to release it to all of you, I have a drop down menu here, and I can select all students, or I can release it selectively to specific students. So I might decide that I'm going to be working with one group of students on this lesson today, while my other students are um, still finishing up something that we've worked on previously or maybe this group of students um, have struggled with this concept so I'm going to be workshopping with them while the other students work independently 
on something a little bit further along the track. So I can very easily select here, I might release this lesson to Juliana and to Robin, and I can just select them while nobody else will have access to this. So I can be very specific in who I'm going to release which material to. Now I'm just going to unselect that and hide it from you. So I'm going to dive into this lesson today with my students. And you'll see to begin with, I'm in prepare mode. So by default, prepare mode is the mode that a lesson will open in. And it's where I have all of my editing capabilities, where I'm able to modify any of the aspects of this lesson here. I'm not going to do any of that just yet. We can pretend that I've pre-prepared. We're going to come back to that right towards the end of the session. Right now, I am ready to teach. So I will be clicking across into the teach window here. And I can also release the lesson from here directly. So I don't need to go back to the lessons page. But having a glowing keyboard and a screen in front of me, um, even as an adult is difficult to resist, but as a, as a teenager or as a child is even more so difficult to resist. So in the beginning stages of this lesson, I'm going to ask my students to have their devices closed or, or at least closed over. Um, and hopefully you won't have to ask them to sit on your on their hands. I have quite literally had to ask a group, a group of students to do that before when I was working with um, year seven boys over here in New Zealand. But um, this just helps students keep the focus with you, with what you're working on at the front of the room, uh, projecting your screen so that you can introduce them to some of the aspects of the lesson before you ask them to get started. So at the very top of every lesson is at least one learning goal. So this fits in beautifully with explicit teaching and visible learning. We are wanting our students to understand the purpose of the lesson and the learning goal identified at the very beginning here is that by the end of the lesson, we are going to be able to classify different forms of energy encountered in daily life. So again, my students aren't in the lesson yet. We can have a conversation about what any of these specific terms mean before we get started on, on any of the um, deeper knowledge or content that's within the lesson itself. You'll also notice a series of beautiful puns throughout our lessons. Keep an eye out for those too. Right here, you're being introduced to one of our career profiles. So as I mentioned, each unit has someone who from the field works in this particular area of science and they guide us through the unit and talk about how this type of science, in this case, um, different types of energy, applies to their daily work. So I can scroll through the lesson here and we might look at specific aspects of it together as a class before I get everybody in. Now, what I'm going to do, and excuse my scrolling, is find the key question. And there's a very specific reason for that. The key questions within our lessons act as success criteria. So I have identified my learning goal. And now I'm wanting just to briefly show my students so that they are aware that this here is the key question. So this is the one where they're going to have the opportunity to demonstrate their understanding of the learning goal. And I think it's really nice to introduce your students to this before you get into the nitty gritty of things, because it gives them an idea of what the end point is. So we've established the learning goal, and this question is going to give them the opportunity to demonstrate that. And we can see that with this little icon, which is visible to the students as well. So the, the key question for them within this lesson requires them to classify the different forms of energy in this video of a man eating breakfast. 
so it's really nice for them and for me to have this in mind as sort of what we're working towards as we go. Okay, I'll be scrolling back to the top now. And I'm also wanting to do here a little bit of direct teaching before we get started. So right at the beginning of the lesson, there is a short section of text as well as an image of some solar panels on the roof of a house. Now, for any students that have English as a second language, Style works really beautifully with Google Translate. So I can highlight a section of text. And if I have the Google Translate um, add-on installed in my browser, I can then select any language to translate that into here. So if I'm wanting to see it in Spanish, for instance, I can then open that in Google Translate or I can see it directly um, in the breakout on in that breakout section there on my page if that is my um, default language. So that's really helpful for students that are working with English as a second language. There we go. So you'll also notice as students that you'll have a little icon above the section of text there that narrates um, anything that's on the page. And that is useful for um, students that might have literacy difficulties. Although our suggestion is that you would be working along with your students on this. So here I've got each of you in my classroom and I would be talking through this with you. We would talk about how we see solar panels more frequently now on rooftops. And of course, we have a problem that the sun moves through the sky during the day. So if the solar panels are fixed on a roof, we have this challenge that the sun is moving and therefore we can only use the energy that is available when the sun is hitting those solar panels directly. And the question here, and this is linking back to this phenomenon of biomimicry, which really ties beautifully throughout this unit, is can we solve this problem by learning from nature? And having asked that question, we're now leading into a visible thinking routine. And I will very shortly be playing a video for you before I unleash and let you into the lesson to answer some questions. So you may be familiar with the See, Think, Wonder visible thinking routine. We'll be watching a very short video that shows a field of sunflowers. And while you're watching it, I'd love you to think about each of these three questions. What do you see? Based on what you see, what does that make you think? And then from those thoughts, is there anything that you wonder? So I'll play the video for you. There's no sound with this one. We just need to observe before I then release the lesson and you'll be able to type directly into the table here uh, with your thoughts around that. So what did you see? What did you think about it? And what did it make you wonder? Let's watch the video together first. I hope you can see that okay. It will be available on your page once I release the lesson to you as well. But because it is so pretty, I'm just going to play it one more time. Okay. And it's at this point that I'm now ready for each of you, my students, to dive into the lesson. I'm going to release it. And on your style page that you've logged into in a separate tab, you'll see that the title of the lesson, 1.2 Lesson Forms of Energy, will appear there for you in blue. You can click into it and that will bring you to this page. What's really handy for me is I can see at the top of the screen here how many of my students have opened the lesson and how many haven't yet started. So this is really helpful for me. I can see, oh, 
Peter might be a bit stuck, I'm going to go and check on Peter and see if there's anything that he needs from me so that he can get into the lesson. If you are stuck, don't worry. I am just about to put a link in the chat that will take you directly to this page. Um, Joshua, I see your comment there. Uh, you're not quite supposed to come to that conclusion directly, but that is very much the direction that we are hoping to nudge you in throughout the lesson. So we'll scaffold it a little bit more, a um, little bit more than that. Wouldn't that be wonderful, Aaron? <laughs> okay, so I can see that you are in the lesson now. You'll just be scrolling down to question one and typing into the spaces here. So you'll just click into those directly and you can type what you saw, what you thought and what you wondered. I'll give you a few moments to finish on, finish that off. Okay, now I can see here that 12 of my 16 students have responded, which is really helpful to me. Again, as I hover over, I might identify some students that, that are a little bit stuck. So I can see poor Peter's lagging behind a little bit again. I might go and lean over his shoulder and, and, and check on, on how he's doing um, and help him access this question if that's what he's needing from me or make sure that he's not having any technical challenges. Something else that I'm able to do within teach mode is I can model for my students what the response to this question might look like um, either before or following their contributions. So for instance, I might add here some of the things that I saw. Well, I saw the sky turned red and I thought that that was an interesting color for the sky to turn. But that made me wonder, why did the sky turn that color? Now you'll notice I haven't commented specifically here on the things that I expect my students to be commenting on, but I've been able to model the thinking process. I may also have commented more specifically on some of those things that, that we're leading our students towards. But here I was just hoping to model that thought process for my students. Now, I've got this show responses button. And by clicking this, I'm sharing my screen at the front of the room. This is where the real power of visible thinking routines comes in. So here I'm able to use the thoughts of my students as a resource, not just for myself to understand um, how my class is tracking as a whole, but also other students are able to build on what, what um, their peers have said and develop further develop their understanding based on these ideas. So right now the names are hidden. I've brought up the responses of the students in the class and I can use my arrow keys to scroll through these responses and look at them together with my students. We might talk about some specific uh, points that have been made that I think are really interesting. So I can see this person, what did they see? They saw the sunflowers moving. They thought that it was really cool that the sunflowers could do that. I, I agree, I think that's fantastic. And it made them wonder if the sunflower was moving because of the sun. So together as a class, we can look at what our peers have thought about what we saw. And is there anything different to what we thought? Is there anything similar to what we thought? And we can unpack that thinking process together. So it's a really beautiful metacognitive tool. 
So um, what I'm hoping my students will come to here, and I'll no I noticed it very beautifully put in the first uh, response that I saw, is that they saw the flowers changing position to follow the direction of the sun. They thought that this must be to help them maximize the amount of energy. And it made them wonder if we could do something like this with solar panels. So this, this student was very attuned to what I was talking about in the introduction here. And you'll see there's a section of text right beneath here that talks about how sunflowers are indeed following the sun. They face east in the morning towards the rising sun and they slowly rotate until the sun sets in the west. Now there is a team of scientists that have actually developed a material that mimics this ability and they've shaped them into tiny little rods that they've called sunbots. And what they're hoping is that they could be used to coat solar panels in a surface that would then respond in a similar way to sunflowers. And in that way, it would maximize the amount of energy that solar panels can gain from the sun. So this is an example of biomimicry. And we have a wonderful link here to um, an article in the Science News for Students if students are wanting to learn a little bit more about that or if you're wanting to dive into that within your lesson as well. Okay, so we've been introduced to this idea and we're now going to talk a little bit about the forms of energy. So I might ask my students to read this section of text independently, I might lead them through it myself, or I might ask them to work with a peer in the class next to them uh, sitting beside them or the group of students that they're sitting with to read through this section of text and then to respond to the questions beneath it. So if I can ask each of you to have a have a brief skim through, I'm sure it will be um, it will be familiar to each of you, the forms of energy, and then respond to questions two, three, and four and I'll give you a few moments to do that. Now if I can ask you, I know you've got your student hats on already, but if I can ask you to respond just as a student might respond in a class, so i.e you may not get it correct or you might not be sure, that would be really useful for me just to demonstrate what that looks like from a teacher perspective. Okay, so really, again, useful for me having this information above each of the questions, I can get a, a read on how my students are tracking, working through this lesson, I can see when we're ready to move on. So it looks like we're still working away on those questions. Right. Now, above both questions two and three, I have 
some familiar looking buttons. I have the show responses button and I have the show answer button. And now that all of us have responded, that's fantastic. I know that we're ready to talk about this question a little bit more. So I might show responses or show the answer. I can do these two things together or I can do them independently of one another. So it's one thing just to ask my students to respond to the question, but we really want to do a little bit more than that. We want to talk about it. We want to understand the, the um, selections that our students have made. So I can show responses here. And this is showing me the distribution of answers within my class. So I can hover over and see which students have selected which. And I'm able to drill down into this a little bit more by asking some questions. So I can see here, um, and I would never do this in reality, but I can see here that only one student has said that it's false. I might ask Juliana, and again, I would never do this because she's the only one who's chosen this option. So what I'm more likely to do is to look at the students who have selected that it's true, okay? So I can see that, uh, oh, Peter. Peter has said that this is true. Peter, could you tell me what was it that made you select true? Was there something in the text that made you choose that? Or maybe it was something that you already knew before? It was kind of something I knew before. <laughs> so That's okay. Yeah, we use knowledge that we already have all the time in science to, in to inform our decisions. So it's something you knew before. You were familiar with that term kinetic. Mm -hmm. mm, okay, you've heard it before. Then I might ask, was there anyone who chose that same option as Peter, but maybe they chose it because of something that they saw within the lesson? And I'm sure that there would be a student who told me, yes, I read it in the section of text just above. It says that kinetic energy is the energy of movement. Now, what I'm expecting to happen is that all of these students who weren't sure or who said that it was false are likely to change their mind. And it's exactly what I want them to do. I want them to walk away with the correct information. So Juliana, she might now decide that she's going to click true. And what will happen on my screen as she does that is this will jump up here. And we'll see that, in fact, Julia has, Juliana has now chosen that it's true and she no longer thinks that it's false. So I am expecting my students to be modifying their responses in line with what we've just talked about. And you can see that some of these numbers have changed already. Beautiful. Now, um, I can then also show the correct response. And I can do those two things together or separately. So with this one, we may not go into much uh, as much depth as, as we discussed this one. I, might, I may just want to reveal the answer, um, but I do have some options to discuss each one of these and um, consider why we've chosen each one. Now, question four was a beautiful drag and drop task. I really like this multimodal um, form of question here that I, it requires students to use some of that visual interpretation as well. So this is asking students to label the main forms of energy suggested by these examples. So I can, again, show your responses. I've also got the option to show a model answer. But I've, again, I've got plenty of options here. I may not have asked my students to answer this question independently. I might have wanted all of us to respond to it together and I could ask one of my students to tell me where they think this label goes. And we could work through it um, all together, building on some sort of core, um, some core knowledge as a class, as a group, any, um, any students that are able to give me this information and we can then um, use that collectively to respond to the question. And then I might ask students to simply match theirs to what we've worked on as a class together. So I do as well have the option to model here in teach mode as well. So I can show responses, as I mentioned, and like, like we did with the See, Think, Wonder, but I'm just going to go straight ahead and show the model answer.
And this then is going to let students check that they were on the right track. Okay, now we have lots and lots of questions in this lesson, so we won't go through them all together right now. There is a, a beautiful brain uh, mind mapping activity here. We're not allowed to call it brainstorming anymore. I have to, I have to remember that. Um, a mind mapping activity here and some written response questions. All of these that have the same options as I mentioned earlier that I can bring up my student responses by clicking the button here and I can use my arrow keys to scroll through and have a look at those and we can discuss them together. Okay, I'm going to keep scrolling. I'm going to head right on down to that key question that we, um, that we looked at right at the beginning. So that is question number 12. And I would then ask my students to work on this. And this one they'll be working on independently. So they're not gonna be working with the person beside them. I need to know just how they are tracking and progressing in relation to the learning goal. So for question 12, I'll ask each of you to scroll down there. And again, I don't worry too much about the quality of your response. You are wearing your student hat, I'll remind you. But we've worked through the lesson on the different forms of energy. And I'm now asking my students to consider this video of the gentleman eating breakfast. What are the forms of energy? And what are some examples of how we see this within the lesson? I'll give you a moment or so to respond to that question now. Okay, now again with this being a key question, I wouldn't want to be showing responses on a shared screen. But if I'm lucky enough to have a, an iPad or a tablet or even just on my cell phone, it's really handy to bring these up. Um, I particularly find it really useful with, with a tablet because I can, I can wander around. So what I might do on a separate screen or even just in a separate tab, if I, if I don't have something that I can move around with, is look at these responses so that I can get a gauge very quickly of where my students are at in relation to the learning goal. And this gives me information that I need to respond straight away. So if I could see, and I'm going to show the names because this would just be for my purposes as a teacher. If I could see that James wasn't quite on the right track, I could then go and have a conversation with James about um, any misconception or misunderstanding that he might have. And I can do that straight away. So I've got the information that I need. I don't want any misconceptions to continue to develop. I want to address them immediately and steer the student back onto the right track um, towards that learning goal. So again, my arrow keys makes it really quick and easy to scroll through each of these. and. Um, once again, very, very useful if I've got an iPad or my phone and I can, I can look at these promptly. Um, I, and I can look through and I can see if everyone is on the right track. So if I can pick, again, if I can pick up someone um, has moved off track slightly, I can then go and have a conversation with them. I might identify a group of students that could do with a little bit of assistance from me. 
and I might bring them together to do a little bit more teaching around this idea while the rest of my students work independently on the following questions. So this one, a short story about how you got ready this morning, describing four forms of energy. If students have demonstrated an ability to respond to this question, they will be perfectly capable of doing this independently while I'm working with these students um, that I've identified as needing a little bit more support and further teaching here. Where the model answer is really useful for me in this instance is it doesn't rely on me having all of this knowledge in my brain. I'm not necessarily an expert on every type of science, but I have this myself to refer to so that I've got an understanding of what I should be seeing in my student responses. Okay, now let's imagine that we've worked to the very end of the lesson. I'm going to ask you all to scroll down to the bottom and click on that submit button. You'll see there's another visible thinking routine at the end that's used for reflection. I used to think, but now I think. We can encourage students to consider the learning that they've done during the lesson through that as well. But each of you, that you will have a button right at the bottom in blue that um, will ask, that will submit that lesson for you and will tell me as a teacher that you have finished. So before we talk a little bit about uh, what you are now able to see now that you've submitted that lesson, I'd love to give you an opportunity just to have a bit of a chat about that. What were some of the things that you saw within that demonstration that you found useful? What are some of the techniques that you might like to adapt into your own practice? What was interesting uh, for you within the last, uh, last gosh, almost hour now? Um, what, was, what was it that you saw that you um, were interested by or that you might like to try yourself? I'd love for each of you to um, Contribute. I'm happy for you to do it in the chat. You might be happy to unmute yourself. I'm excited to see students discussing and building on each other's knowledge. Yes, that is that is the most exciting part. Um, now, I, I've just seen in the chat that there is no sound on the video, and I'm actually quite relieved by that because. <laughs> That sound of chewing would just be too much for me. So you would have had to do some some inferring that there would have been sound on that video and it would have been the sound, uh, you know, um, of him banging his spoon on the bowl, which would have driven me up the wall. But, um, yeah, you would have had to do some inferring. Yeah, Robin, I, I love seeing students um, have that little spark that's brought on by the ideas of others and then being able to build on that. Yeah, Jeannie, I know. I, I, <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't have coped with that. Was, was there anyone else that saw um, any, any, anything that excited them about being able to use some of those techniques with their own students or anything that interested you specifically? Tony mentioned you like the sequence. Yeah, so hopefully um, you'll, you will have been able to see how we generally scaffold um, the sequence of learning. So we start with those lower order skills. We start with very much multiple choice questions, drag and drop, before we then ask our students to really apply that learning and think a little bit more deeply. Yeah, William, you mentioned um, the layout of the lesson and, and modification. Yes, we'll, we'll look at, at that very shortly. Yes, seeing the guidance of the lesson as well, and also having students be able to work at their own pace. Fabulous. I want to mention anyone... that uh, the style team has taken our updated NGS 1 and 2 pacing calendars and put the lessons in sequence. And then the CIA teams, Monday and Tuesday this week, did further work to refine those pacing calendars, and they're up on the website. So you can 
click on the green style on NGS1. It's a different color for NGS2, but you can get right in there. And even though we're looking at both middle and high school lessons here a little bit, um, we can level up and we can change the language. Alex, something you haven't mentioned yet is that they can delete parts of whatever lesson, add their own yeah. favorite things. Maybe that'll be coming. It's coming. I promise. Um, and, and I will be referring to those documents too, because um, as Robin mentioned, our, our team have done some work on those on making sure that based on your pacing calendars, we have lessons that match with everything that you're going to be teaching. Okay, now the next step for me as a teacher is the analyze step. So I've, I've done the teach step. I'm now wanting to analyze my students' work. And Analyze gives me just a bit of a bird's eye view of where everyone's at, um, how they're going. I can see that there are five students still working, 11 have submitted their work. And I've got a question analysis here too. So for the multiple choice questions, it gives me a really quick way to see Okay, cool, we've all got this idea pretty soundly. I can drill into it a little bit further if I like and identify which students gave which response. But I'm very happy with, with question two. I'm not too concerned about that. Now, question three, I can see, oh gosh, okay. Um, maybe, we, maybe we need to come back to this concept uh, in the next lesson. So I, I've got information here that's helping me to inform my next teaching steps. Again, I can identify students that might need um, some specific interventions here by drilling down into that, but I can also see which students are on the right track. So it's giving me lots of information here. Now, what of course I'm most interested in is this question here that's highlighted. This is allowing students to demonstrate their understanding of the learning goal. So this question is the one that I'm wanting to give feedback on. I'm wanting to focus my attention on. I can give written feedback on all of these questions, but we know that feedback is most effective when it's uh, not sparse, but when it's targeted, when it's directed in, in the most important place. So knowing that this question is allowing students to demonstrate their understanding of the learning goal, this is the one that I will click on to view the responses. And this is the one that I would be giving written feedback on. So this here, again, I've got the same functionality with my arrow keys to scroll through. And I can use the keyboard shortcuts here to give a, uh, a check across or to leave a comment. So if this is right, it's correct, I can hit R for right and that will select the tick. I can choose W for wrong to give it across and I can hit C to leave a comment. So um, don't worry, James, I'll, I'll change your cross. I'll change it back to a tick. Okay, now I can then hit that C to leave a comment and I can say, well done, you've identified a number of different forms of energy in the video. Now, really helpful for me is that I'm also able to show the model answer or compare them and have them sitting side by side. So what I can do here is I can say, oh, OK, James hasn't included heat energy. I might then say here, what about heat energy? Do you see any of that in the video? OK, and then I can use the arrow key and move to my next student and I can work through giving my written feedback on this question for all of my students. So really lovely to have the uh, model answer right there for me to refer to. I can copy and paste from it even if I so choose. Um, in fact, I might actually do that for Tony. I might be trying to tell him that I'd like to see a little bit more detail in his answer. So I'm going to hit C, I'm going to write, I'd love to see some more detail here, Tony. And what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to directly annotate his response. So here where he's written serial, I'm going to point out, I'd actually like to see a little bit more here. 
I'm going to annotate it and I've copied uh, this example. I'm going to paste it in here and then click done. So what will happen now is when Tony hovers over this, he's going to see my comment. And this is really nice for things like pointing out when students have used um, the right terminology. So I might say, great use of terminology. So that inline feedback is really useful too. And I would work right the way through my, through my class using my arrow keys, really nice quick way to give written feedback here, just on that key question where it matters the most. Okay, so what will happen is students will see those comments directly on their page. They would see them directly during the lesson, whether they had submitted or not as well. If you each navigate back to that lesson that you had open, where if you have clicked submit, you'll notice if you scroll up that some of the questions now have automated feedback. So it's important for you to know that um, even without you having to do an awful lot, your students are receiving feedback on some of those questions without your input. So the multiple choice questions, for instance, based on the option that you have chosen, you will have received specific feedback. So if you chose the incorrect option, you might notice that it will give you a little hint about where you might look for the correct um, information. Or if you've given the correct response, it might uh, congratulate you for having done that. So multiple choice questions and drag and drop questions like the interactive canvas where we match the word to the picture with the type of energy, that one also will give you some, uh, some feedback based on the options that you chose. So I haven't had to have any input there, but my students are receiving that information. What I'm about to do is make even more information available to you. So I am going to scroll to the top and I'm going to go to my grade book. And this is where all of the information is kept in one place. It's really easy for me to see at a glance um, all of my students and all of the lessons. And I can also filter them. So if I only want to see one student, I can just look at James or I can look at the whole class together. I might select to see a group of students and I can do that as well. I can filter um, in addition to that. So I may only want to see the assessments or only the lessons that I've released. So this is the, this is the only one my students have worked on. This is the only one that I'd be interested in. Okay, now I have some options here. I can look at one student's work more closely. So for example, I know that James has done some beautiful work, so I don't mind going and having a look at his lesson. I can click here, I can view James's work, I can request resubmission, or I can release the answers. Now, I'm not going to do that yet, but I am going to release answers very soon. Firstly, I'm going to view James's work. Now, generally, I wouldn't do this for every student. It would be it will be time consuming to go through every student's work, but um, right the way from beginning to end. And generally, I'll be strategic. So I'm using that key question. If I'm if I'm concerned about a specific student, I might scroll through their work from beginning to end. And so I'm going to look all the way through James's lesson now and see what his responses are. And again, I do have the option to leave comments on all of the questions that he has responded to. So he's got some automated feedback here. So I don't need to comment on those ones. He's got this automated feedback as well. And I'm just really, I'm just interested, has he responded to all of the questions? And I, as I scroll through, you'll see that anything that hasn't been uh, responded to with automated feedback has been marked already. I've already marked this one and I can see my comment here. I can scroll right down to the bottom and if I so choose, I can leave some summary feedback here. I can leave audio feedback too. So I might click on the audio feedback button and say, well done, James. Great to see you're understanding the different forms of energy. And that will then appear for James. Uh, 
on his page so that he's able to hear my audio feedback as well. So if at this point I wasn't happy with James's work, I could request resubmission. So it's wonderful if students are able to use the feedback to respond to and then make changes that show the progress in their learning. They can request resubmission here. I can also release the answers. So all of those beautiful model answers that you see, I can make those available to my students. So I'm going to, initially I might request resubmission, give James some feedback, ask him to improve his work before I released the answers. Now, if I scroll back up, I can see that the model answer appears directly beneath each question. So I would give James specific feedback on that key question, but he's still getting the model answer and any automated feedback on the other, other questions as well. So I can really be smart with the way that I'm using my time here. Alex? From Yes. You covered that the teacher could offer for students to resubmit. Can a student also think, oh, I need to resubmit that and do that on their own without the teacher? They absolutely can. So you'll notice at the bottom of your lesson page where you have clicked to say, I'm finished, show my teacher. You can click on that again and say, oops, I want to take it back. So if if you've decided, oh, um, I do want to I do want to make some improvements here even without me asking you to you can go ahead and do that. Now within the grade book I have some of those options at a whole class level. So I can release the answers or request resubmission from all of my students here. So I'm going to release the model answers to everyone. And what you'll notice now if you submitted your lesson, so if you didn't this hasn't released the model answers for you and I don't want it to because you're still working. So I don't want to give you all of the answers while you're still working away. But if I know that these students have finished and they've just actually forgotten to click submit, I can collect, oops, I can collect their unfinished work first and then release the answers. So now everyone has those model answers on their page. If you scroll up, you can see those. So that is a bit of a, a dive through the teach and analyze sections. What I'd love to do now is show you the prepare phase. And this is where it all gets very exciting, where you're able to modify the content and um, really make it your own. So as Robin mentioned, our team has done some work on your pacing calendars. And I will just show these for you now. Which one will I show first? NGS one, there we are. So in the documents that you see here, which you may recognize as your pacing calendars, you can see in green the links to the style lessons that relate to each specific unit. So really nice and handy for your planning purposes to be able to identify immediately which lessons you'll be using. But what is even better than that is that those lessons have then been collected. I'm just going to share this tab again for you. Have then been collected together and put into one really easy to find spot. So if I'm browsing my lesson library, I can find the school library for the district. Now, for you, you aren't going to have all of these other libraries. It's going to be really easy for you to find this um, Salinas Union library. And then you'll see right there this folder, Matter in the Universe, that is all of the lessons that I'll need to teach this unit all in one place. And I can just click copy lessons in this folder into my subject. And it is as easy as that they are copying their way now, but all of the lessons that I will need to teach that unit are now uh, duplicating and they will appear in my subject. There we go. So I now have my unit, Matter in the Universe, ready to go. 
And this is where we can um, look at the prepare aspects. So I will go straight into the introduction lesson. And as I mentioned, it's in prepare mode to begin with. I have a number of options here. I can decide whether the lesson is assessed or not assessed. I can set a due date. I can print here the teaching notes. So you'll notice that throughout the lesson, there are a number of teaching notes that are not just guidance around the content, but also tips and tricks around how you might hold um, specific discussions around certain ideas about um, some uh, of the purposes of the different activities. So here it will tell you that this question here is a diagnostic activity and it will tell us some of the common misconceptions about atoms and, and matter can be found here if we want to brush up on those. So lots of really useful tips for you as you are exploring these lessons and you can print those to refer to while you're teaching. You can also print the model answers or if you have a student that doesn't have a device or isn't able to work on a device, you can print a student handout as well. So while I'm preparing, I'm scrolling through and I'm reading these teaching notes, I'm familiarizing myself with the content and it might be here that I realize uh, I actually want to change some of this. I might decide that uh, I don't want to cover some of this material. I might decide that I want to add and remove or modify, and I can do all of those things. So by using the edit button, I can change the wording of any of the questions. So I might decide to simplify some of this language. I might decide to change some of it. Um, I can do anything that I choose using the text editor here. I may even just decide that I want to bold some of the key terms here. So um, I might like to bold this word neutron. There are lots of things that I can do to any of these questions. I can delete things altogether. So if I didn't want to use this question, I can use the more button and I can simply delete it. And in the same way, it's just as easy for me to add material here. So using the add content bar, I've got a number of different options. These are all of the tools that our content team use to create lessons. So I can add a section of text, I can add an image, I can add an audio file, I can share a file, so I might have my own uh, PDF file. I might have a document that has some data in it that I want my students to be working with. I might have a video that I'd like my students to watch. So in fact, I'm gonna drag this video tool over here, drop it into the lesson. I can upload a file that I already have on my computer, but here I'm actually going to search, um, use this search bar and the search bar searches the internet for relevant videos. So if this lesson happened to be about photosynthesis, I can search for that. And here it is, it's bringing up for me a whole range of relevant videos. I might be wanting to use thinking this, okay, this crash course one looks good. I can preview it here. Photosynthesis, it is not some kind of abstract scientific thing. Great looks like what I'm after, I can then click use this video. But gosh, it's 13 minutes long. I'm definitely not going to want to use the whole thing. I might just want to use the first two and a half minutes. And maybe I'm just going to cut out the beginning because I know that he's going to ask me just to subscribe to their channel. I'm, I'm not interested in that. So I can trim this video and make it exactly the section that I want before I click done. And now it's just that short section of the video that I've chosen that is available for my students. So as it plays, it's going to play just the section that I wanted. Students aren't going to be able to, to navigate to watch the rest, but it also means that when I'm playing it for my students, it goes straight to where I want it to go. 
I might then like to ask a follow-up question. So uh, we're going to watch a short video. Maybe then we are going to respond to a true or false question. And I might say photosynthesis is the process that animals use to gain energy. Is that true or false? Great. True, false. Now, I can then also add automated feedback. So I can say, well done, or not quite. Watch the video from, there we go. I can guide them in the right direction. And in my settings, I can also choose, is this a key question? Is it a challenge question? Or is it just a standard question? Great, then I click done and it's right there in the lesson. It's ready for my students to use. So all of the tools here, the same ones that our content team use are available to you to simply drag and in cross into the lesson, modify and change and use as you see fit. So anything that's here is completely customizable, editable, and you can add uh, to your heart's content. So you'll recognize some of these collaborative tools, the live brainstorm and the live poll. There is a written response, a mind map. The interactive canvas was what we used to uh, drag and drop, but it's really useful for activities like labeling, for instance. And one of my favorites is the open response question. So I'll drag this in and just to show you how this one works. And I can ask all sorts of questions. I might ask a really big question, like how does science impact your daily life? This is a big question. And I might have some students who would very happily write paragraphs on this topic. But I might also have some students who would prefer to give an audio response. They might find it really challenging to write. Uh, I may have some students who would prefer to draw what this looks like using our digital canvas, or perhaps they want to create a mind map before they start writing. So this open response tool is excellent for this multimodal uh, learning and for allowing some student agency, letting students determine how are they best going to be able to demonstrate their understanding. So I absolutely love this um, this uh, question type. Alex, we have a question from Aaron. I just want to make sure I'm not assuming. Are you familiar with Edpuzzle, a YouTube video? Uh, I'm actually not. Okay. <clears throat> I think that um, you would have your students go to Edpuzzle separately. Either now, that that is a, a good point. Um, now, I'll just point out, because it depends on uh, on sort of the structure of um, Edpuzzle, but it is, it is possible to embed some aspects of other uh, sites into style. So for instance, um, I'm not sure if you are familiar with FET simulations, uh, but let me, um, I actually will just, go ahead and uh, I have a brand new computer you see so I don't believe that I have any more on um, any stored on my desktop but let's have a look so FET simulations these are from the University of Colorado and they do really beautiful interactive simulate simulations for both science and for math so let's let's look at a physics simulation for instance you may have seen these before, but any simulation that is HTML5 can be embedded really beautifully into a style lesson. So one of my favorites is the circuit builder. Oh, good. Um, so here is our circuit construction kit that lets students build electrical circuits. Um, so if I choose this simulation and if I download it, I can then really quickly and easily add it to my lesson. So if I add content now, 
All I need to do is use the share file tool. I drag that in. And I'm just going to drop that H, whoops. I'm just going to drop that HTML file right in there. That's going to upload. And while it's working away, um, my students are going to be able to use this simulation directly in the Star Lesson. So it really is a hub for everything that they need. They aren't going to need to um, go between tabs or between windows. Everything is going to be available for them right then and there. And I can ask any follow-up questions here too. So I'm not sure if Edpuzzle is compatible in the same way, but it's it's really useful to know that FET simulations are, and anything with HTML5 is compatible and can be dragged in and used directly on the screen there. You're most welcome. So that is loading away. It might, it might be a slightly bigger file, but if I, let's try my luck with a refresh. What I'm hoping to see, there it is, is the simulation right there ready for my students to interact with directly within style. So we can build circuits here. Um, you might have seen this one before, I do like it. Um, so students can have a bit of a play, they can build their circuit, and they can do this all within the style lesson. They don't need to go anywhere else. There we go. Um, so it's really nice to, to be able to drop um, those things like that in there. We do build a number of our own simulations as well, and you'll find those throughout our lessons. But what I'd love to do is let all of you loose to have a little bit of a play. So I'm going to walk you through the steps that you need to be able to do that. Firstly, I'm going to go to my home page and I just want to check that all of you have teacher access. So if you can do the same within your star window in the top left corner you'll see in the black menu bar a button that says home. If you can click on that button and tell me if you don't have space to enter a subject name. So if you don't have space to enter a subject name that will be because um, you may not have activated your teacher membership yet. And all I'll need to do is just scroll through and check so I can see that James is set up as a teacher, Tony's set up as a teacher, uh, Cynthia, you're there, uh, Jeannie, great. So it looks like um, most of you are in here. Is there anybody, if you could let me know in the chat, any of you who aren't able to create a subject. Okay, looking good. Deirdre, let me just see if I can find you, Deirdre. No, okay, that's good. I can add you. And let me just find your email address. Anybody else while I'm at it who isn't able to create a subject. So really easy for me just to invite teachers via email there. So Deirdre, you'll receive an email to activate your teacher account, but looks like the rest of you are good to go. Fantastic. So, from the home page now, you'll remember at the very beginning I created my subject. So you, you're wanting to name this after your group of students. You might be teaching uh, NGS1 and you might then like to include your name at the end or anything that makes sense for you to name this particular group of resources for that group of students. Once you've named it as you feel is appropriate, you just need to hit that create subject button. And once that turns to green, it's ready for you to open to add resources. So once that is ready to go, you'll just click in there. And I'll give you 
just a few moments to, to get to that point. It's from here that you would browse your lesson library. So again, I've got lots more options than you will, but on, on your screen, you'll be able to view the star library itself as well as your district library here. So to go to the district, district library, you'll just need to click into it and you'll see there is the concierge uh, folder there. So this is the one where we've put together all of the lessons for this first unit. And if I'm wanting to copy this unit, I just click on copy lessons in this folder to my subject. And that's making its copy for me there. Where you would navigate to the star library itself. So if I click back, navigate back to the very beginning, or I can just close that window and come back to the browse lesson library, it's also where I can access the star library as a whole. So if you're wanting to look at the whole variety of things that are available to you within the library, that would be how you would do it. And again, you can filter by the uh, branch of science, by the grade level, and you can search for key terms as well. So if I was interested in genetics, I can search for that. And it's then gonna bring up the relevant units for me. So you might have made a copy of that uh, concierge unit, that first unit one, or you might be browsing the library here and you might decide that you'd like to add one of these units. The science news lessons, for example, or even the escape room. So let's say we're wanting to add the escape room. I'll click on that one and I'll click add unit and continue. And then this is making my own personal copy for me to have. Alex, we have a couple questions about teacher access to style in the chat. And so since style is not through Clever, um, I'm accessing style directly through the internet. Um, but I wonder for all of the teachers, and maybe this is a question for Peter, is their best way, once they've set up their account, to go straight to style? online that's right so you want now that you have uh, logged in once it is really easy for you now just to go styleapp.com you can bookmark that page and heading straight there you can sign in using your regular credentials that you use to log in um, for any school related uh, thing with your school uh, Salinas uh, email address and matching password, and you should be able to log in directly uh, right into there. So it should be nice and easy for you. And Helica Polito has joined us late, Alex, and I wonder if you can quickly give her access or Peter, or um, she can go in and find an old email that I sent earlier this week, if that's the best. No, I can very easily give Angelica access. Angelica, could you please just add your email address into the chat and I'll I'll uh, add you in there. Okay, so now once you have some content within your subject, you can go to your copy of the unit and it's from here that you can have a real play around. So I can now click into any of these lessons and I can modify them by using those edit buttons, using the delete options and so on. There is one last thing that I'd like to show you before I give you some time just to have a play and then we'll come back together to um, answer any questions. But it is possible to duplicate lessons and to copy and paste between lessons. So I think you'll find those things quite useful. If I have a student who, or a group of students who perhaps need specific differentiation, 
So maybe they would really need me to simplify the language within a lesson. I can click into this lesson here, Structure of Atoms. And what I'm going to do is actually duplicate it. So using the three dots here, I'm going to duplicate the lesson. And what I'll see now at the bottom of the file is I've got this the structure of atoms and it's got a number two at the end. I'm just going to put that up with the other one so that they're together so it's easy for me to see. And now with this duplicated copy, I can go in and I can make all of the modifications that I want to make for perhaps its lower level literacy. So I can go right in here and I can change uh, any of this. So I might say the idea that all matter is made up of tiny indivisible particles. Well, gosh, I, that word just makes things a little bit uh, tricky. I'm going to get rid of that one. Um, it only became widely accepted. I said, okay, okay, I'm okay with some of that. Um, all right. And then, okay, I'm actually happy with most of the rest of that. So I can click done. But I can go through and I can make any modifications that I like all the way through. I might actually want to replace some of these written response questions with the open response question that we saw earlier. I know that this, this student or this group of students might actually prefer to use the audio tool to answer this question. So I'd like to give them that option. I'm gonna copy the text here, paste it here, uh, now that was a key question, so I want to make sure that this one is a key question too. I'm going to click done. And then I can remove this one. And I've given my students the option for how they want to respond to this. I might also sort of delete some of these higher order questions that are going to be too challenging for, for this group of students. I might decide I'm only going to keep the one key question and I'll keep that reflection activity. Okay, nice. Now, when I go back to my lessons page, I can then decide that I'm going to release this lesson to a specific group of students, but I'm going to release this lesson to a different group of students. And I can make sure that they can only see one of these two. So lots of ability to differentiate to a really fine level here. Now, was there anything else that I was going to show you? I was going to show you. Oh, yes, the copying of questions. Great. So the one other thing I'll show you, say this protons and electrons lesson. Maybe this lesson looks great to me, but actually I'm a little bit worried. I don't know if we're going to have time to work through this whole lesson, but I really like this question. What I can do is copy this question. And then I can go into any other lesson. And I can paste it. So I'm going to use that same more button. I'm going to hit paste and it will just appear directly beneath it. So I can copy and paste between lessons, I can duplicate, I can modify, I can add and delete. And I'm going to give you some time now, Angelica, I will get you into uh, this subject right now. I'm gonna give you some time now just to have a play, have a look at all of those editing tools, see what you can, see what you can do, Ask me any questions that you've got while I'm here. Okay, Angelica, you will get an email now that will let you in. So please go ahead, have a look in the library, look at all the different ones. Joshua, that's absolutely right. And, and at this point, you might just like to make a subject just to have a play with. Um, you might like to call it trial or test. Um, and then you can very easily 
delete it later. Ah, yes, Robin, sharing your work with other teachers. Now, there are a couple of things that I will point out there. One is the school library. So you'll recall that we um, collected some resources from the school library that uh, Robin had shared into there. They were the ones that our team had put together. Um, the school library is an easy way for you to share resources with anyone who has access to that school. So I might decide um, that I've modified these lessons. So I'm going to make it really clear. It's important that the naming of whatever goes into the school library is really clear. So um, escape rooms, and I might just call this um, differentiated for ELL. I want to be really clear what it is that's in there. And then I can use this more button and click share with my school library. And now this folder is going to be available within the school library. It's just as easy for me to remove things from the school library in the same place. However, if I'm going to be doing a large amount of modifying, it might work really nicely for me to actually have a subject that I share with my colleagues where we don't have any students. So I might decide that I, I'm actually going to call this uh, NGS1 teacher space. I'm going to create this subject. And this might be where my colleagues and I collaborate. So I can add some co-teachers here. I might decide that I'm going to invite uh, my colleague Maeve. I might invite uh, Robin. I can invite anyone that I please here using their email address. And these teachers are now going to have access to this subject. It's called teacher space, so I know I'm not going to add any students there. But what I'll do is I'll put um, some lessons in there. I'll modify them um, any way that I see fit. And, you know, as I mentioned, I could do a number of things. I can make them suitable for a specific group of students. I can uh, tailor them in any other specific way that I like. And then within this teacher space, any colleague who is also a co-teacher is going to be able to view and copy these resources and they can then paste them into the subject where they have their students. So this is just busy copying away, but I can, um, once it has loaded from this teacher space, any modifications that have been made, I can then copy the whole folder or just lesson by lesson and paste it into the subject where my students are working. So this is a really nice way to collaboratively modify lessons. You might decide that you're going to work on this one and a colleague is going to work on this one. and then you've all got access to these resources together. So I can copy the whole lesson. And then from teacher space, okay, I'm now going to go and paste it into here where my students are. And I wouldn't put it in the escape room folder, but I'm. let's just say maybe I'll put it in here. And I can paste from the same place. So I can paste between subjects and you'll see that it will appear right at the bottom there. So that's a really nice way to work collaboratively.
So please do use this time to, to have a bit of a play. Um, let me know if there are any questions at all that I can answer. If you stumble across anything, I'm here to help. Mm, yes, deleting a class. So um, depending on whether you are referring to a subject or a class, so where you have your students, um, you might have a class in here that, that you can delete. So I have class A and class B. I can just delete one of those. If I want to delete a whole subject from within the subject, so maybe I'll delete this uh, teacher space from within the subject, in the green menu along the top where you have options, you can rename, duplicate, archive, or delete. So um, really handy to be able to rename and to archive. Maybe there's something that you aren't using just now, but you may like to refer back to. You might err towards archiving it rather than deleting it, or you can just go straight ahead and delete from here too. Alex, in my account, I see concierge and GS1, concierge and GS2 and NGS3. And I've tried sharing um, the concierge and GS2 because um, Aaron Tisdale needed access. Mm. So hopefully that um, now all NGS2 teachers can see that if I shared it with the library. Let's have a test. I'm not able to, but that could be fixed by a refresh. Let's have a look. Oh, good. Adam sees it. Um, I'm sure it's there now. I'm sure I just needed to. There it is. Excellent. Thank you. And there's only three NGS3 teachers, but all three courses are now in there. Wonderful. Alex, do you see Jose's question on the style terminology? That's between a subject and a class, yes. Uh, now, the difference there is the class is the specific group of students within the subject. And I'll, I'll show you one way that, that might help um, just to make that really clear. So this is the subject that I created at the very beginning of the session and I added each of you as my students. So this class is this group of students but I can have more than one class within a subject. So I might have two groups of students that I teach, I both teach NGS, I teach both of those groups 
for NGS1. I can add a class here. So I might um, class A and class B is fine. I can add a class here. And what that allows me to do, I'm actually just going to put some students in class B. So I'll put uh, James in class B and I'll put Tony in class B and I'll put Juliana in class B. What this allows me to do now from the lessons page is I can release at a whole class level. So it might be first thing in the morning, I'm teaching class A, so I'm gonna let them see this lesson now, but I'm not teaching this material to class B until tomorrow. So I'm not gonna make it available for class B just yet. So that is the difference between um, a class and a subject. You can have multiple classes within a subject. The subject is the collection of resources and the class is the group of students within that and you can have multiple I'll put you all back in the same class now but this can also be another way to differentiate you might have um, students in one class that you modify lessons for in a specific way and then if they are in a separate class it's really easy to assign those modified lessons to that specific group of students Thank you. You're most welcome. So yes, it will be really beautifully easy for you to, um, your students will already be in the right place. So you won't need to worry too much about doing all of that um, yourself. We'll make it just as easy as we can. Now I'd love to give the opportunity for anybody to ask me any questions because I know that you do also have to do an evaluation. Um, so Robin has popped that link into the chat. We're obviously uh, in sync there, Robin. We're on the same on the same uh, train of thought. So please go ahead and complete that session evaluation. Lisa, the grade book. It's confusing. Okay, is is it just because there's a lot there? Um, it, it's, it's confusing for you now in, in particular because you won't have any student data within it, but we can take a closer look at my grade book where I have some student work, if that would be helpful. I just remember be, last, I tried this last year and I wasn't quite sure what to do with all the data that it gave me, you know, it's like, yes. yeah. Now, using those filters can be really helpful for that because there, there is a lot of information. Even just looking at this, it's like, wow, there's a lot of information. So I'm I'm going to choose here. I only want to see the lessons that I've released because these are the ones that my students have worked on. So I, I, you know, I'm not interested in anything else at this point in time. And what we have added um, since last year is this this key, which will be useful for you. And what this will tell you is whether the student is, is working on the lesson, it's been submitted, or whether you have uh, responded to it. So perhaps you have requested resubmission, you've collected um, the work, or you've released the answers. Now for a lesson that isn't assessed, there isn't a huge amount of information that I can get here. But if I have a lesson that is an assessment. So if we look at um, one of the tests, for instance, if I make this available to everyone, and it's a bit, a bit mean of me because no one has done the test, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into my grade book. I'm gonna look here. I've got this test. I'm going to collect all of the unfinished work now, none of you have worked on it, so it's not very nice of me to do it. Um, but And all of you are going to get a terrible score. But let's, um, let's see what this tells me now. So this is going to collect all of my student work. It's going to grade it for me. And based on uh, all of that work, it's going to give me here my percentage score and a mark once it's been uh, marked. So, okay, I've collected the work. I now want to release the feedback and answers. 
And here we go, now I can see the percentage score. I can also view some details. So great, I can see the student's percentage, their score out of the total, um, and I can request resubmission or, or do anything else that I need to from here. So um, with this type of lesson, the information that's in the gradebook is a little bit more, more useful for me. Uh, with a lesson like this one, I'm just able to see, is it in progress? Has it been submitted? Was the student absent? So I can mark a student absent for any particular lesson just by clicking. Um, so really just gives me a bit of a, a zoomed out view of all of the data that's there. And Alex, I see the export button. Will that be a Google Sheet? Uh, it is. Uh, it can be exported in multiple different forms. So if I export the marks, I can. I'm interested to see what it's going to do by default. So um, it will email me when the, when the download is complete. And it does that just because sometimes um, if you've got a lot of data in your markbook, it can take a little bit longer. So, But I've got here the two options. So I can download a CSV or I can download it in Excel format. You're going to get more information if you download it in this format. But whether or not you have Excel, um, you can then just simply drop this into Google Drive and, and that will open as a sheet for you. Now, I should mention, I know we're just about finished, but anything that is a little bit tricky or confusing, we have a fantastic support function. So the support button that you see in the black menu across the top, if you click, you can search for specific terms or phrases here. So maybe I want to know, um, oh gosh, I've accidentally released the answers. What do I do? If I click on that link, it's going to take me to an article with really clear step-by-step -step instructions, annotated images, everything that I need to know. And if I'm really stuck, I can write a message here to our support team and they will get back to you as soon as they can. They're very prompt. They are, however, in Australia. So sometimes you might have to wait a little while, but definitely within uh, 12 hours, you will have a response from somebody. And that's going to speed up too with our US team sort of coming on board as well. And Juliana started with us today and we've got a couple of other hires for uh, people based in California that will be coming yeah. on board this next month and two. So. And they love hearing from you. So you could even just say, hi, it's me. I'm from Salinas and um, I'm using Style. And they would be very happy to, to hear from you and they'd send you a reply, I'm sure. So thank you everyone so much for your time this morning. It's been lovely to have you all with me. I do believe you've got a break now, so I will leave you to it. Uh, but I've loved having you with me this morning. I hope you enjoy style and everything it has to offer. Please do uh, get in touch if there's anything you would like from us. And I'll send each of you a, a follow-up email with some information to Robin, if that's all right. Um, thank you again. And please do reach out if there's anything at all that you need. Thank you, everyone. Please complete Thanks, the email. Everybody. Bye. Be sure you signed in. This was wonderful, Alex. Thank you so much. Oh, you are most welcome. And please let me know if there's anything, um, anything that I can change for subsequent sessions or any feedback that you have. I'm more than happy to take that on board. I will. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. I'm going to hang out just in case somebody has a question, if you're still here. Hi, Robin. 
Um, I can totally email you if this isn't a good time. I had a quick thing about chemistry to ask you about. I don't know if anyone's listening, if it's private, but um, this is a great time for me. We can talk. Okay. No, it's not private. I just, um, I worked on the PBA one. So the one that's linked in the hyperdoc is the most recent version, okay. but I, I did w what you suggested and I just did screenshots of some inner orbit questions. So I know that's not like the final way how it'll be incorporated. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Okay. And I'm going to work on them as fast as I can. I have, I, I think six times two, so 12 PBAs to put into synergy yeah. and I'll, I will work on it quickly because I know we want the chemistry teachers to comment after it's um, finalized. A finalized draft. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I really just came to this one so I would have an idea of this. I know it's not a resource for all courses at this point, but um, it's pretty cool to see it. So it was still really interesting for me. So yeah. Okay. And I know you need resources too. So yeah. I'll, I'll talk to people about that again and yeah. again. Thank, thank you. you. Teachers who are still here, do any of you have questions? I'm going to be the last one here. <laughs> 